All right. Good morning and welcome, folks, to the Palliative Care Friday Chalk Talks. I am excited for today's case-based episode on buprenorphine because I have the honor of introducing two people that really need no introduction and kind of have been on my wish list to have as guests since we started this project a few years ago. Um, first, we have Dr. Katie Fitzgerald-Jones. She's a nurse scientist and a palliative and addiction nurse practitioner within the New England Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center at VA Boston Healthcare, and an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Her clinical and research interests include improving substance use disorder, pain management, and quality of life in older adults and people with serious illness. And when Katie is not binge reading romance novels. She is an avid pickleball player. Welcome, Katie. Thanks. I'm always recruiting uh, pickleball partners. If anyone's that age, Pam wants to pickle. Excellent. Uh, second, we have Dr. Janet Ho. She is an internist at the University of California, San Francisco, who is fellowship trained and board certified in palliative medicine and addiction medicine. She attends on the addiction consult service at the Zuckerberg General Hospital and UCSF, and is the site medical director for inpatient palliative care services at Parnassus. Her clinical and research interests lie at the intersection of serious illness, substance use, pain, chronic cancer pain, harm reduction, and the use of buprenorphine. And with her one-year-old, four-year-old, and eight-year-old poodle, her current state of fun includes exploring coastal trails around the bay and then learning the countless ways to use her new portable carpet cleaner. Welcome, Janet. Thank you so much, Bernie. <laughs> yeah, for having me. Absolutely. So our format for today is going to be two parts. Um, we're going to walk through a presentation with three cases with some teaching pearls, taking roughly 20 minutes or so. And I think for simplicity, we're just going to wait to open it up for questions from the audience until the very end. So with that, Katie and Janet, I will hand the floor over to you. Awesome. Thank you. So we will probably blitz through some of the background to make sure that we're all on the same page when we start out these case discussions and that we can really have a fruitful discussion about those. Um, and so if you need to refer back to the slides or to some of the overview and background, like feel free to do that at some point. I'm just going to point out some highlights as we go through. So to start out, our learning objectives are really to get a, get a basic and functioning understanding of buprenorphine to be able to apply that to your clinical practice. And we will talk about some cases where, uh, some different cases where this might pertain to you. Okay, next. So to start out, buprenorphine is a unique opioid. It is an opioid, it's a schedule three opioid, um, and it's different from every other opioid in your toolbox. And the things that make it different are one, that it has, a strong affinity to the mu opioid receptor with a slow dissociation. So essentially it's a strong binder and what's on, it's on for quite a while. Like the half-life is somewhere around two to three days um, and it dissociates slowly. So you can really consider it as a longer acting opioid medication. And then the really unique feature of it is that it's a partial mu agonist. And this is in contrast to the full mu agonist that we're used to managing such as opio uh, such as morphine, oxycodone, fentanyl, heroin, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the key distinction here is written is that Partial mu agonist does not mean partial analgesic. The partial mu agonist part is really, really helpful when we think about what we consider a ceiling effect with buprenorphine, which means that even with greater doses of buprenorphine in a system, you do not get cumulative greater side effects. And this is really helpful for things uh, such as protecting from respiratory depression or sedation and things we think as well as mu opioid effects like constipation, um, maybe some cognitive slowing, um, and euphoria. So this is how it's helpful both in pain and in the treatment of people with opioid use disorder or addiction, or perhaps some complicated dependence on it. Now, the buprenorphine also binds to not just the mu opioid receptor, but also uh, has some kappa opioid receptor antagonism, which is thought to actually help improve mood stability. So this helps reduce 
cravings for opioid. It helps to reduce dysphoria. Maybe it helps to reduce hyperkatemia, which is kind of the long-term complicated mood uh, state that you get with long-term exposure to opioids, especially at high doses. And formulations, I think of it as a range for what's available. And it's really great because we have a whole spectrum of buprenorphine strength. So on the lower dose side, so low dose formulations are things like transdermal and buccal buprenorphine. And these are things that are FDA approved for pain. And you'll see that they come in microgram dosing. So just, you know, it's not really apples to apples, but micrograms kind of indicates that these are lower doses. And on the other end of the spectrum, I think of the higher dose buprenorphine products. So we're talking about sublingual buprenorphine and the injectable like IM, uh, or sorry, sub-Q products, uh, which we don't really use yet in palliative care. Um, there is IV buprenorphine and, you know, you can use that uh, however fits your clinical need. And so the beauty of this is that depending on what formulary you have uh, available to you inpatient or outpatient to your patients, you can really find the dosing that will work for your patient and get them to get them what they need in terms of analgesia. Uh, and Janet, I cut ahead from the other slides, but just um, the major teaching point was that the high moderate to high dose product, the Suboxone is often buprenorphine co-formulated with naloxone. The naloxone is not active unless injected. And in patients with end-stage liver disease, sometimes you have to drop the naloxone component and use buprenorphine as a mono product. Yes, thank you. So the combo product, buprenorphine naloxone, is really FDA approved for the treatment of addiction. Um, and as Katie pointed out, the naloxone is considered to be only active as a misuse deterrent if somebody were to inject or were to um, inhale, like snort at their Suboxone or buprenorphine. Uh, both of these mono product and the combo product come in generic and the mono product, the buprenorphine alone is a lot more cheaper than the combination product. Um, Wait, other way around. Um, the buprenorphine naloxone is cheaper oh, no. than Suboxone than um, Subutex. Is that what you're saying? No, the Subutex is cheaper than the Suboxone. Oh, um, the brand name? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so anyway, unless you have a clear indication for using the combination product and it cost is a prohibitive factor, there may be ways to use, you know, either that's available for you. Um, one other key point is that you don't need to dose reduce um, or dose adjust for renal failure, except for your usual clinical uh, kind of safety precautions. Um, but buprenorphine can be used in dialysis and in-stage renal disease. It's just with liver failure, as Katie mentioned. Um, and it's really like severe decompensated liver failure or people with like child's pew class C. Uh, so buprenorphine rotation in people on long-term opioids. One of the, I think, lingering misperceptions from the era of the X waiver, which is now gone. So anybody with a DEA license can prescribe buprenorphine for any indication is that uh, sometimes people have this carryover shadow from the X waiver training that buprenorphine can cause precipitated withdrawal in somebody who's on full agonist. And that's true if you add the buprenorphine into a system where there is full agonist that is active on the mu opioid receptor. And this is again, because buprenorphine has a really high binding affinity. So higher than most of the other opioids. And when you introduce it into the system, it will essentially displace the other opioids that are already there. And you'll go from this full mu opioid effect that you're experiencing down to the partial effect. Um, and that delta is experienced as precipitated withdrawal. It doesn't mean that you can't titrate the partial mu opioid agonist up to a place where you can get pain control though. Uh, but this abrupt change is what feels like precipitated withdrawal. And the point is that now there is robust evidence that there are ways, there are many ways to transition somebody who's on full agonist onto buprenorphine. You might see it called uh, low dose initiation or the Bernese method or microdosing. Um, 
but they are all essentially this staggered cross titration. So you want to start buprenorphine essentially at very little doses with enough interval in between each dose to reach equilibrium and build up on the buprenorphine until you reach a certain threshold, at which point you have, uh, then you're able to take off the full agonist. So you keep the full agonist while you're building up the buprenorphine. It's like anybody who, if you are you know, trying to temper eggs or something. You don't want the eggs to scramble, but if you introduce the warm liquid slowly, then you can get everything up to the same temperature. I also have one of my big takeaways from that study is um, that um, people, again, sort of equate that partial um, agonist effect with partial analgesic. And that, that systematic review shows that people even when they've been on long-term opioid therapy for a long time, do just as well, if not slightly better on buprenorphine, probably because it's combating that hyperalgesia um, and having that those benefits that Janet described. Um, and when I find that, um, I'm just going to take over for a second, Janet, because I know you didn't write the slides, but it probably is harder for you to say, but I've noticed that as we go into the cases that people, when they're starting buprenorphine, often have to have this cognitive shift um, where they think a lot about, like, I'm going to have this long acting medicine, I'm going to have this short acting medicine. And if I rotate somebody to buprenorphine, that's typically at a steady dose and isn't intended to treat acute pain. Like, what are they going to do for PRN? Um, and the big the big takeaway is that both that Janet described, you can add a full agonist to buprenorphine uh, once the buprenorphine is at steady state, but also there are many instances where people do just fine on one product, right? I've had these common things where I start a long acting in a patient and they don't use any less PRN. <laughs> um, and I think about this with buprenorphine um, that there's a good chance, particularly um, for patients that have had longstanding chronic pain, that I can get the buprenorphine to steady state and they don't need a PRN. Um, and I can use buprenorphine as like my mainstay of treatment. Um, so you don't have to clutch your hands to this short acting, long acting all the time. Um, and you can tailor your dose towards the patient indication. And I'll just add to that too, that if you were switching somebody to buprenorphine for indications where you only want them on buprenorphine, you can use low, low doses of buprenorphine or smaller doses of buprenorphine as the breakthrough or short acting. So you can give, you know, like two milligrams sublingual here, or there as PRN, if you didn't want to prescribe any other full agonist. And uh, just as a caveat, you know, buprenorphine is great and we're underutilizing it in palliative care. At the same time, we don't have the same dearth of evidence that, or we don't have the same wealth of evidence that they do in chronic pain, for instance, on the use of buprenorphine. So we're still trying to figure out like people like researchers like Katie are still trying to figure out who are the best patients to benefit from buprenorphine? How far can we push it in pain and serious illness? You know, is there a limit to its use for somebody with like terminal pain or someone with like actively changing cancer related pain? Uh, that aside, though, there is a large swath of patients who would benefit um, in thinking about buprenorphine as a potential uh, analgesic for them. And so some of these cases will highlight uh, some of these patients. Um, so just some, some rapid fire cases uh, built on real life experience. Um, so this is an 80 year old older adult with multiple myeloma. Um, she was taking 12 milligrams of hydromorphone a day. Um, this was just like a patient that was added on to my schedule in clinic one day. Um, turns out, you know, it was my job to fix her pain, but she had been in the hospital for about two weeks and they couldn't fix her pain. So instantly I went into this visit terrified, um, including that she had this rapid response in the hospital when she was given like homeopathic doses of methadone, she became obtunded. Um, and so she was taking all these full agonists, but really not getting any relief, was extremely distressed about, I'm taking all these things, I'm taking all these pills, and I'm just sleeping all the time, I'm not enjoying my life. She was like, had this incredible meatball recipe that she made, and she wasn't able to do any of those things. Um, and so I being the buprenorphine evangelist that I am really uh, wanted to rotate her to buprenorphine, mainly because of opioid side effects. Um, and although she was on 12 milligrams of um, hydromorphone, 
which you can do the math to figure out it, it falls into the category of, of um, probably getting coverage by low dose products. Um, I really wanted to do the buprenorphine patch because um, of those complaints that she was having of pill burden and like that her life was just revolving around both pain and um, taking a medication for it. I also wondered if she was having some hyperalgesia, so even though you would see this with more long-term use, it just, her pain really was spiraling out of control. And she was really depressed um, in part, uh, probably because of the long-term opioids, but also just having really poor pain control, a new diagnosis. And um, titrating her opioids also felt incredibly unsafe. She had this like narrow therapeutic window where you couldn't go up. Um, and uh, being an older adult, she was also high risk for an unintentional overdose. I can tell you um, she did amazingly on a on the buprenorphine patch. We started at five just because it was like go low, go slow situation. Um, <clears throat> she ended up, I increased her to 10. She kept one dose of hydromorphone at bedtime because her pain was worse at night. Um, and I saw her maybe um, a month after in clinic and she brought me meatballs in a Vera Badly bag and, and thought I was the best thing in the world. Um, so major buprenorphine success in this frail older adult who wasn't tolerating opioids. Um, do you have anything to add, Janet? Uh, I'll just add that when you're starting somebody on a transdermal patch who's otherwise on full agonist, the transdermal or butrans, the brand name website actually can has a calculator to help you if you're new to it, uh, figure out which patch dose is appropriate to start. Caveat being that, you know, that is pharmaceutical funded data and they tend to be more conservative. And so if you need to titrate up quickly, that wouldn't be unexpected. And I think for most people who use buprenorphine patches, our conversion will be a, a little bit different, um, but that is a safe place to start. And you can always put a patch on somebody who's on full agonist with very, very little risk of uh, initiating precipitated withdrawal. And, and that's easy 20. Yeah, and she um, the fast facts on the patch is also really good by Julie Childers. Um, uh, two additional kind of pearls from her case is she did a little contact dermatitis from the patch, which happens in about 10 to 20% of people. And one of the um, tricks of the trade is that you can use a fluconazole nasal spray to put a spray on the skin, uh, let it dry, and then um, put the patch on on top of that and the contact dermatitis can improve. It's a little like MacGyvery, um, but it tends to work. Um, this patient also didn't have um, insurance coverage for the buprenorphine patch, which was obviously not um, ideal, but because of how distressing her pain was, she decided to pay out of pocket for it. And we went on good RX um, and it cost her $90 a month. And her kids were so happy to have her back as her personality that they each chipped in $25 every month. And it was like the buprenorphine fund. Um, and ultimately they came up with this on their own and said, you know, given all the medicine she's taking for her cancer, like this is nothing. Um, so not ideal, certainly, and, and can be cost prohibitive, but good RX has been really helpful. Be before you um, move on, could, yeah. could I could I pick your brain about one one uh, teaching point in the last case? You you brought up theoretical risk for QTC prolongation. Do you guys ever monitor QTCs on your patients on buprenorphine of of any formulation? Yeah, I think the QTC prolongation is a bunch of garbage. Um, there's no data that buprenorphine causes torsades. There's some ingredient in the patch in the US that can prolong the QTC, similar to like how IV methadone can prolong the QTC more than PO. Um, and in Europe, they use much higher doses, but also that QTC black box warning on the patch was before the QTC threshold for the FDA was greater than 500. So um, even then it it might not have a black box warning today. They sort of get inherited. So uh, the short answer is no, I do not. What about you, so John? The studies out there show that, you know, even though it may prolong the QTC in an absolute value kind of way, that there's been no clinical significance of that. So no cases of torsades versus methadone, which does do both. And that said, I don't check the QTC for people on buprenorphine. I might take a look at it if someone happens to be on a lot of other QT prolonging meds and it's available, but I don't make a point of checking it. And that's even for patients in my addiction practice who are on 24, 32 milligrams of buprenorphine sublingual a day. So very high doses. 
and people get switched from methadone to buprenorphine be, to um, because of QTC. So it's certainly in the hierarchy of things that prolong the QTC. Um, not not a big concern. Um, I'm going to skip the last case because a lot of the teaching points were the same. Um, but this is a 53 year old with pancreatic cancer on cancer treatment, and has been on long term recovery um, of his opioid use disorder. He's on um, pretty standard doses of 16 milligrams of um, buprenorphine a day. Um, I think typically what we see for opioid use disorder is around 16 to 24 milligrams a day. Um, but he's experiencing worse, worsening cancer pain. Uh, one thing I would uh, caution people to do is try to be a detective to see is this pain or opioid use disorder. Uh, people can have uh, often have both, and this is really a false dichotomy. Um, so uh, you can disavow yourself from trying to determine whether somebody has pain or if they're drug seeking and just assume um, they have uh, pain and trying to understand what's driving their distress. And people can often tell you this by assessing things like cravings, et cetera. Um, so for this patient, what we did was add a full agonist to their buprenorphine. Um, again, you don't run the risk of precipitating withdrawal when you add a full agonist to establish buprenorphine doses. Um, it was really important to continue on his buprenorphine. Um, and it, pretty much in um, most instances, buprenorphine continuation should really be the default. Um, median retention in buprenorphine is not great. Um, and so trying to optimize reasons for why people could continue is important. Um, sometimes people say like, I don't feel comfortable prescribing their buprenorphine because they're not getting, um, they're not engaged in psychosocial support such as like therapy or um, with a counselor, but there's really been no, um, uh, no uh, evidence to suggest behavioral interventions are required because buprenorphine alone can improve um, mortality. Uh, so don't require uh, that your patients also engage in outside support for you to prescribe the buprenorphine. And in patients like this that I'm seeing for cancer-related pain um, and also have an opioid use disorder, I personally take over opioid prescribing because I find it much easier to navigate. And then um, if they're anticipated to go back to um, you know, to say be cured from their cancer, um, you know, keeping that relationship with an outside prescriber is important, but where so many moving parts, I think it's really, um, helpful to have a hand on all the opioids people are being prescribed. Um, and I know palliative care clinicians love methadone. And so this is the tip to say that there's no head to head trial that methadone is better for pain than buprenorphine. And in our experience, uh, speaking for Janet here, um, buprenorphine plus a full agonist can be uh, pretty effective for pain and opioid use disorder. And this is supported in the perioperative literature um, where people that got buprenorphine before surgery and, and during the post-op course um, actually used less opioid um, via PCA and other mechanisms had earlier discharges than people who, who which their buprenorphine was stopped. Um, so that was yeah, like buprenorphine in a flash. Um, and we would love to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. We'll we'll open it up here in, in just a moment. Uh, if people want to use the raise hand function or type something in the chat, that would be lovely to give people a few moments to think about what questions they want to ask. I've got two um, for the last case that you guys shared. So Let's say there's a slight change in the case and the patient is actually coming to you on a once daily methadone from a methadone clinic instead of coming to you on buprenorphine. Is your tendency to rotate them to buprenorphine? Because again, we're, we're truly treating both pain and opiate use disorder and it feels kind of muddy and murky us using methadone for opiate use disorder, not being in a methadone clinic. Up, oh, you're muted, Janet. Oh, I will let you talk about it in light of your New England Journal perspective. <laughs> That's why I asked. I read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. I just thought my mother did. Um, so I, I think this is a real area of clinical controversy and one for which I don't have a perfect answer. Um, but I think it's worth, you know, in that New England Journal perspective, what we were trying to underscore is that. Um, clinicians and patients are in, put in impossible situations. Um, 
And I don't think it feels great to take over somebody's methadone prescribing. Um, and I think because of the way that methadone has been regulated, it's really thwarted any generation of science on how to best implement methadone outside of a clinic. Um, and so how to sort of safely take over somebody's methadone prescribing um, and optimize their pain and their opioid use disorder, I think is a place of unsettled um, uh, evidence. And yet there are instances where it really becomes perilous for them to remain in a methadone clinic. Um, uh, you know, right now I have a frail older adult that like really just, he's going through cancer treatment. He cannot get to his clinic. Um, and, um, I don't know what's happening at his clinic. I don't know, you know, um, I can't see his doses on the PDMP, et cetera. And so there are instances where I take home, I take over methadone prescribing, um, indicate for cancer pain and, um, you know, pray that everything goes well and think about other supports that I can have in place. Like um, I have right now for this veteran, I have um, a pill box that goes off. So it alarms him. So he knows to take it. And I know he's taking it sort of thing. And he has VNA in there. Um, I don't tend to rotate to buprenorphine um, because it destabilizes people's opioid use disorder. Um, but I do know in some clinics um, that does happen, if there's an opportunity and people don't wanna be on methadone, you can use that opportunity to rotate them to buprenorphine. But I try to center the patients um, over my own um, sort of uh, what I can prescribe um, because it just feels like that's, you know, we shouldn't be centering policies over patient mm -hmm. needs. So, so in that patient that comes to you on methadone, perhaps your personal more likely approach would be to take that once a day, probably divide it three times a day so you have more sustained analgesia. Yeah, I wouldn't reflexively do it though. Mm -hmm. I would I yeah. would call the clinic, try to get some more information, try to see methadone clinics are now able to give take homes a lot more easily. Um, and so there might be an opportunity where that person could get 28 days of methadone take home and you know, that might be the right solution. Um, so I wouldn't by default automatically uh, split it, but if if you had no other option. Yeah, if I could add, please. You know, <laughs> like an addiction uh, clinical perspective, there are some considerations I would uh, think through before I take someone from their methadone or take over the methadone. And so if it's somebody, and this is where it's helpful just to talk to somebody kind of in real life, um, just flat out about like, you know, what is your history with addiction or with what you've been using? How have things been going? If somebody's been at their methadone clinic and like Katie said, calling the methadone clinic and talking to the medical director or the case manager, or whoever it is who knows that person is really, really key and really helpful. And they could give you a lot of background that either that helps you to strat uh, to categorize this patient as you know being on the higher risk side if you do take over all their opioids or on the kind of moderate risk side. Um, and so things that I would ask are you know how long has this patient been going there? How long have you known them? How consistent are they in showing up to their appointments? You know what dose of methadone have they been on and how long have they been on that because all of that will give you a sense for how stable the addiction is so i have a patient you know who's been going to methadone clinic for 10 years at the same methadone dose you know 120 a day um has the full spectrum of take home so he gets you know 14 um days worth of take homes from that clinic which is their maximum and that gives me a sense like this person's pretty stable in their addiction. He hasn't used for 10 years. I feel a lot more comfortable taking over um, or writing the methadone uh, for cancer pain um, and knowing that I can manage what comes up. If it's somebody, I've, you know, a patient on the other hand who just got into uh, treatment with the diagnosis of cancer, and so they've only been there for a month, um, they're still titrating up on the methadone, they're still using a little bit here and there, that's a patient where I would be a lot more cautious. And I actually probably would not if I were only a palliative care clinician. Um, try to take over that patient because then I would actively be trying to manage both the addiction and the pain. Um, and it gets a lot more complicated. And that's where I would call for backup or co-manage with the medical director. And the patient you described earlier too, that's getting 14 or 28. I, a lot of people around me get 28 days take home is a uh, pretty standard and um, stable patients in Boston. But like, if I take over that, I'm, there's like 
the patients aren't getting anything else. Like they only have to go to the methadone clinic once a month. And so that's not um, in the scheme of like burden, that's a less burdensome um, uh, intervention. You know, I wouldn't, I would honestly probably be doing two weeks um, if I was taking over prescribing. So um, I think those are the decisions you have to weigh. Absolutely. I would, you know, start out with my usual precautions, my universal precautions, be like, let's try a seven or 14 day prescription, see how this goes, you know, et cetera. Um, and I would not switch. I do not reflexively switch people on methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, I was asked to unmute, so I think maybe you can hear me. Uh, my name is Nilifer Kittywala. I'm a physician here at Lutheran General uh, Advocate in Park Ridge, Illinois. Um, we currently aren't using buprenorphine for our cancer-related patient pain, but that's my hope to kind of start doing so. And I appreciate this lecture very much so in the cases that you you presented. Um, one of the things, and I think I have a feeling I know what your answer is going to be, but I'm curious what your spiel is, if you will, um, in regards to pushback that you get from patients when you're prescribing buprenorphine specifically for cancer-related pain um, and kind of helping them feel more comfortable in utilizing this medication as opposed to, number one, opioids that they kind of already feel comfortable with, if you will, in, the, in terms of the idea of it, and then to the stigma in relation to substance use or just opioid use, essentially. Thank you. I mean, I think it looks a lot, my conversation with patients looks a lot uh, similar, looks pretty similar to how I get people to buy into methadone, right? Like the same, the same things will exist. They'll say, oh, like that's only used for people at, at, with substance use disorder. Like why using that in me? And like the same same um, answers really apply. I think for me, the biggest thing has also been believing buprenorphine's effective. So like if I'm hedging to say, or if, or if I'm not convinced that buprenorphine is like quote unquote strong enough to manage cancer pain, like that's going to show up in that conversation with the patient. So um, having the experience behind me um, and the to say, you know, I don't feel like I'm making any sacrifices in terms of pain control and, and have the added benefit of addressing an opioid misuse or opioid use disorder um, helps me make that sell. But um, it's, I think I think it's important to anticipate these barriers and to be in front of it. And um, we're only, you know, opioid stigma, buprenorphine stigma is, you know, really rampant and um, it's important to just continue to um, educate people around the utility. I think it also relates to why you're switching someone over to buprenorphine, right? I think generally, I think that there are two buckets. I'm switching over someone, someone I'm switching someone over to buprenorphine because they have a high risk for adverse effects from full mu agonists. So people who are in survivorship, people with cognitive frailty, people with constipation or at risk for bowel obstructions, people with respiratory, you know, other respiratory pathology that's happening, et cetera. And in those cases, a lot of the conversation focuses on the same thing that you would talk about when you're rotating people from any opioid to any opioid. These are the better side effect profile. This is safer for you, et cetera. The other bucket that I think about is like, oh, I'm switching you over because you're at a high risk for opioid use disorder or you have some active uh, concerning or high risk use. And in those cases, I will share that. And it's also okay if you decide that it's clinically appropriate to tell a patient that this is what I have to offer you. Sometimes it doesn't feel safe for the clinician to continue offering full agonists, especially if I know that, you know, people are selling or sharing the medications, or if there's just been a, a pattern of high risk use, um, or they've had some serious effects, like adverse effects from that. And so the conversation can be challenging, it can be tough. And, you know, that's something that you're all well-trained and great at addressing is the emotion behind that. Um, but it is also okay to set boundaries and say that, you know, this is what I can offer to both treat your pain and to keep you as safe as I can. Um, so this is what I have to offer. I'm not abandoning you. I'm not saying I'm not going to treat it. I believe you have pain. And this is what we have to do that with. And I think um, one thing that sort of segues into the next question too is I do try to think about pharmacies that are um, more welcoming to people with either opioid use disorder or are more comfortable 
filling buprenorphine without um, attitude. Um, and so thinking about what pharmacies and what pharmacies you can partner with, um, having a pharmacist that's a close colleague that understands the reason why you're using buprenorphine plus a full agonist or why um, why it's really crucial that this person, you know, gets their patches um, and it helps you think about ways to get it in a cost-effective way is helpful. Uh, hi, this is Kara. I'm one of the nurse practitioners with the palliative care team. Um, I know in your uh, presentation, you had talked about it wasn't insure, uh, it wasn't covered by insurance. Um, is insure are insurances some of them covering this, or are you finding lots of pushback on coverage of bup? Is what I was wondering. So all all insurers are supposed to cover buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. That's part of the American Disabilities Act. So getting um, uh, suboxone covered, for example, um, is is not typically a challenge for people with opioid use disorder. Um, some of the low dose products are more expensive and I find it just is honestly pretty variable. Like I put the prescription in and I'm not sure. And I think that patient had Medicare, but then another patient with Medicare had it covered. So I don't know if it changed or um, it's hard. It's, it's sort of like, um, when you write for oxycodone and they tell you you have to use um, like one certain pill strength. Like I, I tend to see it's a similar sort of dance. Um, and, you know, I don't know, Janet, if you have more. And now I'm at the VA and um, everything's um, amazing. <laughs> My patients get their scripts mailed. I can get them whatever they want. It's lovely. Yeah, totally agree. The buckle, I feel like there's the most pushback because that is the most expensive um, so I rarely use that, but the transdermal, usually with a little bit back, back and forth with the insurance, we'll get that covered. Perfect. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Janet. This was absolutely wonderful. Great. Thank you all. And Katie and I are available if anyone has questions um, as you go along incorporating BUP into your clinical practice. Thanks so much, Marty, for this opportunity to share with you all. Thank you. You have a great rest of the week. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody.